Thank you for all the comments this morning. Um, um, I appreciate that very much. We're going to spend several weeks on uh, being uh, rescued by Jesus and, and talking about uh, salvation. Next week we'll look at faith and then we'll look at repentance and confession and baptism and, and so uh, forth. And so uh, we'll spend a, a dedicated lesson to each uh, of those at, at the very least. So this morning we spent some time looking at how the Bible describes what we might refer to as the process of salvation. I failed to mention, but if you want a copy of the six-finger uh, uh, illustration, I can, I can get that to you uh, if you'd like to use that. Some people may, may look at you kind of funny when you pull that out of your, out of your Bible, uh, but I can get it to you if you need that. Uh, but the Bible describes the process of salvation as this concept of being clothed or fully clothed uh, with Christ. For some people, uh, I've studied with some people, and it is a, a fairly slow process. It, it takes them a little while to, um, as they, they listen, it takes them a while to, to, to fall into, I guess you could say, uh, or enter into faith. And then that process of faith can take some time and and, but for other people, it is a rather quick process. Uh, their heart is soft, and it is quickly uh, uh, transformed by God's Word. And, but either way, whether it's a slow process or it's a rather quick uh, process, uh, it all culminates in the same way, in being buried with Christ, fully clothed with Christ in baptism, in what... Um, Peter describes in Acts 2 and verse 38 as being immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, where uh, we come in contact with the blood of Christ. But what is salvation? In Colossians 3, uh, Paul is writing to those who have been buried with Christ and then raised uh, with Christ because they have been raised with Christ. He says that their lives are hidden with Christ in God. It's a beautiful spiritual reality that as Christians, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. I, it would be, I think, an interesting study to explore that and exactly what all that means and, and what Paul is, is getting at there. We don't have time for that this evening, but in chapter 2 and verse 11 of Colossians, Paul tells us about the experience of of being buried and raised with Christ. I want to read <clears throat> Colossians 2, uh, verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> or we're going to, uh, 12, 13 and 14. He says, Having been buried with him, that is Christ, in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, pay attention to this, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. In baptism, God works in a very powerful way to strip off the dirty, sin-stained clothes, meaning he forgives us. And Paul says he makes us alive together with Christ. Made alive together with him. I, I want you to, to, to remember that. Keep that in the forefront of your mind. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. But when sins are forgiven in baptism, that person is made alive with Christ and becomes or is clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And before we get any further into answering this question, what is salvation, I want to start with uh, uh, or reinforce a very important biblical truth. Only Jesus saves. Only Jesus saves. I know, I know you know that, uh, and I know you believe that, but I don't think we can say that enough. When uh, Mary was pregnant with, by the Holy Spirit, the angel of the Lord came to Joseph. He, he was going to put her away. And he encourages Joseph to take Mary as his wife. And he says that she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Jesus himself says in Luke 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. 
Peter even tells us as he's speaking about Jesus, Acts 4 and verse 12, says there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation is a work of Jesus. No one else can save you. You cannot save yourself. Now, now that's not to say that the Father and the Spirit don't play a role in our salvation, but Jesus came into the world to seek and to save the lost. Jesus died so that you and I could be justified by his blood and saved from the wrath of God. Only Jesus saves. I just want to make that very clear. So, what is salvation? <clears throat> the word used to describe what Jesus does, at least uh, the verb, is the word sozo, and it means to save. The noun is the word soteria, and it means salvation. And these words, both these words, have a very, we might call it a fairly broad meaning. Anything from salvation to deliverance or uh, wholeness, the idea of safety uh, or being made well. People can be saved from injury. They can be saved from suffering, a disease, or, or any kind of, of, of peril of some kind. You remember the woman that had the issue of blood, what she said to herself. She said, if I could just reach out and touch his garment, I will be, do you remember what she says? Made well. That, that term, made well, is the verb sozo. She, her thought was, if I can reach out and touch his garment, he will save me. And, and we know that wasn't a, a spiritual salvation. This was, he, she, she believed with all of her heart that she would be rescued or saved or delivered from this issue of blood that she had. Her life would be made well. She would be made whole or saved if she could just reach out and touch his garment. But when we think about the, the saving work of Jesus... The Old Testament makes it very clear that the Messiah would come into the world and save people from the penalty of the Lord's judgment. One of those instances where that is made very clear is Joel chapter 2, verses 30 through 32. And so if we were going to choose one word other than salvation of what Jesus has done, I think one of the best words is this idea of being rescued. That Jesus has come on a, a, miss, a mission to rescue people. Uh, the idea to, to rescue or deliver us from the penalty of our sin. Paul makes it clear. The wages or the payment, the penalty of sin is death. And we, apart from that, uh, what Jesus has come to do, Ephesians 2 and verse 1, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But again, uh, uh, going back to Romans 6 verse 23, but uh, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. This idea of life is connected to salvation. And we're going to get into that a, a little bit further. But Jesus came to rescue us and to grant us eternal life. So he's rescuing us from eternal death to eternal life. I want to consider a, a few passages that, that really help us, I think, uh, to see this. The first one is John 5. It's a rather, I didn't put up as much as I wanted to, but this is all that would fit uh, on the slide without multiple slides. But John 5, 24 through 29, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment or, or punishment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and, now, uh, and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So we have this uh, life from death to life, they will hear or listen and live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted son, the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, the idea of punishment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of life of judgment. Jesus says that he has been given all judgment or, or has been given to him 
But everyone who hears his words and believes, or hears his words and, and trusts in him, has eternal life. And that this person does not go into judgment. They will not experience punishment because they've moved from death to life. It's interesting. Passing from death to life. Keep that on in your mind. Move ahead a few chapters. John 10, 27 through 30. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they will never perish. They have, he gives life, and they can never die. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. You back up to verse 10. He says that he has come to give life, and that may have it abundantly. In if we listen to Jesus and we follow Jesus, he makes it very clear that we have life and will never perish. And his salvation is so secure <clears throat> that as long as we continue to listen and to follow, we cannot pass from life back into death. We can't go backwards. So long as we're listening to him and following him, we can't be snatched out of his hand. Or, or this idea of going out of life back into death. Jesus says that's impossible. We can't go backwards. We can't be forcefully taken out of the Father's hands and put back into death. It's interesting that John, uh, later, after he writes the gospel, uh, he will write in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 that our faith is victory. That our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. This idea of, of trusting in Jesus, of, of listening to him and following him, and that we pass out of death into life. And that as long as we're listening and following, we can't go backwards from life back into death. Now, although the, these words aren't really used in this next passage, I think the concept is there. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 and 24, Paul says... Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Not only does Jesus resurrect us from death, I think what we see here is this concept that he sustains us. It's not, it's not up to us so much as it is to Jesus in sustaining us our eternal life. Salvation is also Jesus sustaining our life. And he'll continue to do it. That our whole spirit and soul and body will be kept blameless when he returns. And he's faithful. And Paul says he will surely do this. Not only does he grant us life when we listen and follow him, but he sustains our life, eternal life, spiritual life. Because Paul says, Colossians 3, he is our life. In Ephesians uh, 2, 4 through 6, I'm going to compare it to an, another passage. Uh, Paul says this, but God being rich in mercy because the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he has made us alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved. Not only has he made us alive, but he's raised us up with him and seated us with him uh, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul says something very similar, almost identical in Colossians that we were reading just a minute ago. Colossians 2, 12 and 13. Having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also raised with him, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Salvation is being rescued out of death by being made alive together with Christ and being raised up with him. And it's only possible by God's grace when we respond to him in faith. And when we do that, he makes us alive with Christ and raises us from the dead. Now, I think we've all heard the analogy uh, that, that salvation is like someone who's out in the water and, and they're, they're uh, 
you know, in the process of, of, of drowning, if you will, or if we don't throw out the life preserver and rescue them, they will die. And they're, they're alive at the moment, but if we don't rescue them, they will die. If I understand what the Bible is saying in, in salvation, spiritual salvation, Jesus isn't saving a person who's alive in their sin. Did you get that? Jesus isn't saving someone who's alive in their sin. Paul makes it very clear, Ephesians 2 and verse 1, that we are dead in our trespasses. Jesus is saving us. He's, he is rescuing us from death. Not, not that we're about to die, but in our sin, we're already dead. And Jesus, when we respond to him in faith, the Lord makes us alive with him and resurrects us from the dead. Not physical death. Understand that. Not physical death, but spiritual death. We're already, those that are lost in sin are already dead. They're spiritually dead. They have no spiritual life within them. But when we respond to Jesus in faith, we are made alive and resurrected from the dead. Paul wrote, or we say, in salvation, Jesus isn't saving a person alive in their sin who is in the danger of dying. In salvation, Jesus resurrects a person who is dead in their sin to life. Because Paul tells us that we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked. We are not alive in sin. We're dead in sin. And Jesus rescues us. So, Salvation is passing from eternal death to eternal life. I think that's the, the simplest condensed form uh, or definition that we could give of what Jesus does. As we look this morning, I just want to reiterate it again that Jesus inseparably links obedience to, our, uh, to salvation. But uh, obedience isn't earning my rescue it's not doing something so Jesus says, hey, you are worthy of being delivered or rescued from death. My obedience is because Jesus saves me in response to my faith. And I want to live a life that shows my gratitude and appreciation and thanksgiving to Him. Being made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9, one another one we looked at this morning, Matthew 7 and verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In John 15, Jesus calls this abiding in him. If the, if the, the vine or the, the branch uh, abides in the vine, he says the branch bears fruit, which is proof of life. If, if, if a plant or a tree is bearing fruit, it's, it's proof that that plant or that tree is alive. So he says abiding in him is synonymous with obedience or, or keeping his commandments. 1 John 2, 3-6 through six says, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him Truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we may know that we are in him. Listen to verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Obedience. If I understand what John's writing here, he says whoever abides in him ought to walk in the same way that he walked or live in the same way that he lived. If we're going to uh, say that, that we abide in Jesus, we ought to live the way that Jesus lived. So obedience isn't just about doing what Jesus says. That's a part of it. It's not, obedience isn't blind obedience. We talked about blind faith. I don't just obey just because Jesus says so. There's, there's way more to obedience than that. I think obedience is more about getting acquainted with Jesus. And as Paul says, sharing in his suffering. The more I live the way that Jesus lives, the more I can understand Jesus and who He is. The more I follow Him and, and live the way that He lived, and, and I treat people the way that He treat people, and I, and I minister to people the way that Jesus ministered to them, and, and love them the way that He loved them, and was patient with them, and, and compassionate to them in the way that Jesus was, 
I began to understand and know who Jesus is. When I shared his sufferings, it gives me a better understanding of what Jesus went through from, on my behalf. That's what obedience is about. The more that I live like Jesus, the more I understand who Jesus is and have a greater appreciation for Jesus and what he's done. It allows me to walk in his shoes because the Bible tells me he always did what was pleasing to the Father. And in doing so, I think it helps transform me more into the image of Christ. Well, as I was working on this, a question popped in my head as in explaining and, and trying to understand more of what salvation is and passing from eternal life into eternal death and, and how wonderful and how great it is. is the best thing that could, could ever happen to us. Why do more people not jump at the opportunity to be saved? I think there's lots of reasons for it. We're not going to get into this even. But I'm going to give you two that I think help us. Number one, some people just don't think they need to be saved. I think there's just a group of people that just don't think that they need to be saved. They're good people, and good people go to heaven. That's the prevailing theory when it comes to salvation in the world. They just don't realize that they're dead and need to be resurrected to life with Christ. Jesus told a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector, and the Bible says that the parable was told to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. I think a big reason why people don't jump at the opportunity to be saved and trust in Jesus is that they simply trust themselves and they think that they're righteous, or they think that, they're good enough. Because when I compare myself to someone else, there's always someone else worse than me. But there's always someone else probably better than me as well. But I think one reason is there's a lot of people that think they're good enough and they just, they just trust in themselves. Number two, I think because people love darkness more than light. Jesus said, John 3, 19 and 20, and this is the judgment, or the, uh, um, the judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. There's a lot of people that are just satisfied with darkness. They love the darkness. More than the light. They love, and I'm not, no, I, I'm not necessarily say that, that they know they're evil. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. They just love darkness. More than they love light. They don't want to change. They're very comfortable in what, what they're doing. Maybe, they, maybe there, there's something nagging on them and they know, but they just don't, don't want to pay attention to that. They don't, they don't want to sit with themselves and think about life. They would rather just continue in darkness Wide is the gate and easy is the way that leads to death. That's what Jesus said. It's easy. It's easy just to, to continue in darkness than it is to turn around and walk towards the light. People trust themselves and they love darkness more than light. <clears throat> so I was contemplated this idea of what is salvation, this question. Here, here's the best, simplest answer I could come up with. Salvation is passing from eternal death to eternal life. And it's all predicated on faith in Jesus Christ. And trusting Him, and that trusting Him, uh, that, that belief leads to trust, and that trust leads to humbly surrendering yourself to Jesus and living the way that He lived. And that's what we're going to get into, uh, this idea of faith and and repentance and confession and what immersion is in the, in the coming weeks. But salvation, I think in the simplest form, is this concept of passing from eternal life or eternal death to eternal life. And it's all based on the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Salvation is the process, we want to add to it, of God stripping off the old man of sin and clothing us with Jesus. Salvation is being rescued by Jesus from eternal death by grace through our faith, at which point God makes us alive with Christ 
and raises us up from the dead to eternal life. And I think the question then becomes for us. What are we going to do with the life that Jesus gives us? It's a blessing. It's a gift. And how are we going to use it? Jesus has blessed us with life. He's, he has spiritually resurrected us from the dead and given us life, His own life, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. What are you going to do this week with the life that Jesus has given you? How will you be a good steward of the spiritual, the eternal life that Jesus has given you? Tonight, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we give you that opportunity tonight. Whatever your need is, please come forward while we stand and while we sing.